Hello and welcome to the TechEU show to all of our listeners. And if you're watching this on YouTube, of course, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, thank you so much. Uh, and then you're doing both, listening to us and watching us. So uh, we are going to talk today about VC firms and their approach to ESG, which means environmental, social and governments, uh, and their general approach to all things sustainability, which is a very, very hot topic, of course. I am your host, Robin Walters from Tech.eu. Uh, and the reason that we're going to have this conversation is because it's quite clear that VCs are a critical force in shaping the future of uh, you know, people, planet, and society uh, as they invest in the startups and scale-ups that often lead the way in terms of technological advancement. So uh, in fact, there are even some investment firms I've been told who are suggesting or even downright requiring startups uh, that they back uh, to embed ESG considerations into their business activities these days. So that's uh, a good sign, I would say. Uh, with us today, we have Christina from Your Impact House, uh, joining us from Latvia. Uh, she helps tech scale-ups and VCs uh, with their sustainability goals and strategy uh, and how to communicate them to the outside world. Uh, also joining us today is Elodie Broad. Uh, she was a consultant with Deloitte uh, for seven years. Uh, but very recently joined a top tier venture capital firm, Balderton, uh, to essentially lead their impact and ESG agenda. So just to set the scene a little bit before we start, uh, Elodie's appointment last year uh, followed the publication of uh, Balderton's first, uh, what they call Sustainable Future Goals Report, uh, SFG for short, uh, that came out in December 2021 for the first time. Uh, it, it basically introduced Balderton's uh, 10 SFGs, um, I can't name all of them top of my head, but maybe Elodie can help us out later. Uh, but they were modeled on and inspired by the, by the SDGs uh, from the United Nations uh, to essentially capture the firm's ambitions across a range of sustainability-related topics. Uh, about a month ago, the firm released its second report, uh, which is the first under Elodie's watch. Uh, so we're going <laughs> to ask the first question to Elodie. Um, did you take note of the report that Balderton put out when you were not working for the firm yet? Um, and what did you think of it when you read through it for the first time? Yeah, thanks, Robin. Really great to be with you today. Um, so, yes, I did take notice of it and I was very impressed um, at the time. So that would have been almost two years ago now. Uh, it made quite the splash because it was uh, one of potentially the first um, sustainable report to be published by um, a top tier generalist VC fund. So as you correctly set out, the report introduces our 10 SFGs, so Sustainable Future Goals, and they really span themes from climate action to responsible consumption, looking at the people aspect as well, sustainability, so diversity and inclusion, um, well-being and health, all the way to governance themes, such as uh, ethic, ethics and business standards. Um, so really liked the fact that a VC firm had come up with its own framework, despite uh, the number of acronyms and frameworks that already exist in this space. And maybe more powerful, perhaps, were the three axes of impact that were identified by Bulletin. And so really, what are the three ways in which we can make an impact? So one thing in how we make investment decisions, which businesses we decide to back and which we don't. Secondly, how we engage with our portfolio as minority shareholders. And thirdly, how we do it to ourselves. So how do we want to talk as a firm? Great. Well, you lead those efforts. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on what that role uh, entails specifically? Because I'm guessing it's different for, for different VC firms. Uh, and also maybe how Bolton currently defines and, and implements the goals that you've uh, just described. Yes, absolutely. So as a head of impact, I'm responsible for driving our impact strategy, which follows the three axes. So working with colleagues from operations to make sure that we as a firm are operating as a inclusive, sustainable, ethical fund. Secondly, working with colleagues from the investment team to really bring to bear those SFG commitments in how we source and how we appraise um, investment opportunities and ultimately make decisions. And then lastly, and probably the bulk of my role is working with our portfolio companies, so that's over 100 companies, on helping them either embark on their sustainability journey or accelerate on it. And we do that by uh, providing resources, creating a community around this really important topic of sustainability, giving them the opportunity to exchange and share learnings, what worked, what didn't work so well, 
and finally working as well with um, our investment partners who sit um, on the boards of those companies and so I work with them to make sure they can bring to bear their board member um, role uh, to lean on the ESG agenda. Wow, that sounds to me like a, a whole lot of work uh, and something that needs to be by, done by a whole team rather than just one person. Yeah, um, I, I mean, one of the things that really drew me, I guess, to to the industry at large is I strongly believe that sustainability is a team play. And so, you know, it's a team sport. And, and I guess my role uh, really reflects that, like, you know, sustainability at Baldwin is not just LED. I just happen to be the sort of the driver, the integrator, orchestrator of what is really a collective effort um, across, you know, colleagues, but also uh, founders and portfolio teams and the wider ecosystem. Yeah, super interesting. Uh, Christine, to you. Uh, first of all, can you talk a little bit more about the work uh, you've been doing? I already mentioned that you work with uh, scale-ups and VC firms on their sustainability strategy um, and the work that you're doing currently with VC firms across Europe. Yeah, happy to share. Um, I currently work with smaller VC funds than Valderton, etc. Um, and I help uh, make sustainability more accessible for, for funds like that because um, one of the things that really uh, upsets me sometimes is that it feels like sustainability still is kind of a luxury thing that uh, only large corporations and VC funds can access, but uh, it shouldn't be like that. Um, and I'm here to change that. <laughs> and I work with smaller VC funds. Last, for, last year, I was working with Practical Capital and the first big VC from Lithuania. Open Ocean VC, I work with uh, Pro Founders Capital in UK. So different VC funds from all across Europe. Um, and I help them with um, just understanding what is expected from them, from the regulatory perspective, from their LPs, uh, from the changing expectations from founders and customers. And I help them guide towards building the best practices internally. And sometimes it means helping them write the first ESG policy and creating those processes internally. Uh, sometimes it means uh, hosting a session for portfolio companies so they understand what goals and KPIs uh, they should actually start measuring and tracking and what it actually means. Um, yeah, so it's a very interesting work. Uh, every project is different. Um, yeah, so I hope I gave a bit of an introduction to that to no, my work. I, absolutely, you did. But it sounds to me like a very, very timely service to be offering right now because a lot of the VCs and their portfolio companies are looking into sustainability much more seriously, uh, at least than they used to. Uh, now, uh, Balderton is not the only one uh, putting out reports about this. Uh, your company uh, called Your Impact House. Uh, also publishes an annual report, uh, which is based on a survey uh, that you run uh, on investment firms that we actually on TechEU also help you distribute. Uh, can you share with us some of the headline results from that survey and, and maybe some, some takeaways that you think of uh, that we should be aware of? Uh, sure thing. So for two years now, I've been surveying investors from all across Europe, mostly from my personal network and asking how important sustainability is for them. Um, the idea is that the project, um, the idea for the project came from just conversations with startups and founders and them, them asking me like how important sustainability should be for them because they were, many of them are on the edge and not trying to figure out how, how high on the priority list it really should be. So I went to investors and asked. <laughs> and the main takeaway for both years, actually, is that sustainability is um, and should be a priority um, and a must um, in 2020 and moving forward. Uh, when making an investment decision, ESG risks and alignment with sustainable development goals are listed among top five criteria for investors that I surveyed. And that's for the majority of them second year in a row. Um, and similarly, the results from the sustainability for tech survey shows that uh, almost half of the investors um, selected ESG risks and alignment with SDGs among the most important investment criteria. Um, but at the same time, although this is promising and this is something that I want to see in the industry, 
I it does come with a caveat that the business case still has to be there. Uh, no one has cancelled the business as usual and the financial KPIs. So investors still are looking for great founders, are looking for teams that are building scalable businesses that uh, have a solid value proposition. Uh, so those things still have to be there. But on top of that, investors are looking for alignment with sustainable development goals and companies that understand what is ESG risk and how that affects them. Yeah. Or at least they say that they do, because as we all know, of course, uh, you can answer a survey any way you want. But of course, you have to uh, also take actions uh, to let people know that you're serious about them. Um, I also yeah, read I've... in in the reports that about 60% of the investors that were surveyed uh, agree that sustainability has to be an integral part of any company moving forward. Uh, but I'm also wondering, why isn't it 100%? I think that not every investor is ready yet. Um, some of the investors are finding the business as usual or the old ways still profitable and thinking like, why should they change anything? I think it's just a matter of time till they got they get converted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Elodie, is anything uh, here surprising to you or does that ring uh, true to you? Well, no, I think everything that Christine said is sort of music to my ears. On this final question of why only 60% of investors, I couldn't agree more. I think there's still a degree of short termism in the industry, even if, you know, in VC, we should be looking at we more the long-term horizon and I think we will need unfortunately to see more instances of uh you know businesses that get you know major public backlash or and see this sort of you know sort of value drop as a result of not having met a minimum threshold of sort of ESG performance um so as frustrating as it is, I will I would agree that um, you know it is a matter of time, and actually the progress that we've seen in recent years is extremely encouraging and should be celebrated. Yeah, I'll throw another percentage at you just uh, to keep the conversation flowing. Uh, in your 2022 report uh, with Balderton, uh, there was a claim that 29 percent of uh, portfolio companies are explicitly championing one of the outlined SFGs, Sustainable Future Goals. Uh, and that was positioned as a headline number in the report. Uh, but if you look at it, that's less than a third. So wh why do you think this number is not bigger and how how can we make it bigger? So it might, so you're probably thinking, does it mean that 61% of our portfolio doesn't care whatsoever about the SFGs? The answer is no. So it might be worth just explaining what we mean by explicitly backing. So that's when our, the business, uh, the business model, products and services were explicitly creating a design with a social or environmental mission in mind. So a few examples from our portfolio, we've got a carbon accounting SaaS platform, and we've got a couple of companies disrupting the renewable energy sector. We've got um, companies looking after financial well-being. We've got a number of health tech investments. So all of these have a very clear mission or mission-led companies that were set up with a sustainability sort of outcome in mind. However, what gets us really excited as generous investors is the impact we can have on all the other businesses that weren't set up with, um, you know, a social and environmental mission in mind. But we still have a huge role to play in growing as a, you know, inclusive, ethical, and sort of environmentally minded and responsible businesses. So that's really how we, when we look at our portfolio, we see them in those two big groups. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, inclusive, uh, which I just wanted to touch on because of the 10 goals that were outlined in Balderton's uh, ESG strategies, it's not only about climate change, it's also about uh, things like diversity, of course, and energy, et cetera. Um, but of those 10 goals, which one uh, would be the one that you would say you'll need to focus on the most um, let's say this year to really achieve uh, tangible results for because just to, just to set some context here what I like about the report that you put out is that you also uh, have sort of accountability because you look at the goals that you've set yourself for last year and and actually say like these are the results this is what we you know didn't do very well even though we said we would uh, or even though we set out uh, to do so uh, so what are some of the things that you think you'll have to be you know very involved in to really get it up to speed 
No, absolutely. So we are trying to make progress across those three axes. However, we really see, you know, on biggest impact potential is with our portfolio. And I always like to bring up the stats like there's 65 of us uh, working at Balderton and our portfolio has over 30,000 um, FTEs. So it just gives you a sense of like scale and Viva. So really, um, we thought about you know, I mean, asking me which of the SFGs we focus on is like asking me, you know, pick a favorite child, <laughs> not quite. But for this year, we've really taken a step back. And since I've come in thinking about what I was saying earlier about our role and, and our unique opportunity, but also responsibility as sort of generalist investors and thinking this whole cohort of businesses who weren't set up with sustainability in mind, but we can help build really solid, sustainable foundations at their core. And we can do it early uh, because and that will you know just as they're still being built and and designed and that will pay dividends um hugely both financially but also you know in terms of impact later on so with that in mind um you know if you think about in sort of two to five years time like is it realistic to imagine a company that doesn't have a you know genuine commitment to climate action does not have evidence of diversity and is not showing the highest uh, standards of sort of ethics and business conduct. We believe the answer is no to that. So those three themes of urgent climate action, diversity and inclusion, and business ethics are really our main focus this year. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, Christine, not to put you on the spot, but as a as an independent expert, if you look at what Baldwin is doing and what Elodie is explaining now. Um, how would you assess the general approach to ESG and sustainable investing over there? So that's to not put me on the spot at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, if I look at the communication Balderton has put out, there is so much to learn from it. I really appreciate the level of transparency on the actual progress that you already mentioned uh, on the external and also internal goals. Um, I, I think that's not really common uh, among VCs and also mm, startups and corporations that they are sharing a big major. at least it looks to me that you are sharing either all or a big portion of your internal goals and you're actually saying, okay, so we managed to reach this set of goals for 100%, but these ones we didn't manage to and i think that takes a lot of uh a lot of courage to put it out there and and be open about it um i also looked at the materials um that you have prepared for startups uh setting up your first esg framework and building a sustainable business and i think those are also great resources for startups to take a look at so if you're listening go to their website and check them out i think it's really useful material if you're just setting out on your journey um yeah so uh, overall really great the only question i had after looking at it is how sfdr really affects you and yeah what is your situation with that because i as i understand you invest in europe um so is it worth um, explaining quickly what SFDR is? <laughs> so SFDR is um, so the European EU uh, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation. So a new piece of reg regulation that's being rolled out to try and bring some transparency um, in the sustainable investing to a market. And that's been as a res in response, I guess, to you know, all the sort of discussions and claims of greenwashing. Um, in recent years. So, you know, put simply, it's interest, introducing three different, you can be three types of fund. Either you can be a fund that gives no consideration whatsoever of environmental and social um, sort of performance and factors. You can be one that considers and promotes um, social and environmental characteristics, or you can be an impact fund. So a fund that will put that said environmental and social um, characteristic before profit or will or at least will make a commitment to take their underlying assets from A to B. So obviously we're following the regulation um, closely and, and we do fall in scope as exactly as you said, Christine, we 
um, we, you know, a lot of our clients, so investors, are uh, EU based, and so I think that you know that question will become really pertinent when we, um, you know, next time we sort of we fundraise. And mm-hmm. the only thing I will say is that you know, from what I understand of Article Eight um, and its promotion of environmental and social characteristics, I would feel quite confident with you know what we're already doing. It wouldn't be hard for us. It wouldn't be, you know, trying to sort of retro sort of fit or, or fundamentally change how we do business and how we think about investments to credibly uh, go to markets as Article 8. So short answer is we're following it closely, as is everyone. And, um, you know, the, the regulation is underpinned by principles of transparency and data collection, which is something that we we Put, we put in place two years ago and we try and improve on year on year. Yeah, thanks Thanks for picking that up, uh, LOD. Um, now, so we can we can all agree that Balderton is doing good work, uh, but it also kind of shows how little work uh, some of the other investment firms in Europe are doing, or at least uh, uh, not doing yet. Uh, and but, but it's also difficult to sort of benchmark, like how, what do you specifically need to do as a VC um, you know, in comparison to your peers, because they're also, uh, of course, active in other markets. Um, Christine, what would you suggest to an investment firm that's, you know, they've expressed an interest in sustainability, they say it's important, they want to get started with their ESG journey, but they don't have the resources to hire by people like Helody. Um, what, what would you suggest to them to how they get started? Um, so for a VC fund that is based and operating in Europe, I think the first step uh, now in 2023 uh, should be to go go back to their legal team and check in with their LPs and see what are the current regulations and legal requirements just to make sure that uh, everything is put, put in place. Um, as we already discussed, Balderton, for example, has done quite a bit to have the data um, and the processes in place. Uh, but Putting it in place takes at least a couple of years. Um, so if you haven't started, then start. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, one thing is to comply with regulations, and that is just the bare minimum at the moment. Um, but uh, after understanding what is the level of expectation there, I think there should be a bit of soul searching and understanding which side of the history actually you want to be on. There's plenty of data nowadays that that prove that sustainability can be profitable. So I wouldn't say that that should be the question anymore. It's a matter of values of the founding team and the board and the uh, key man, like the main management team. Um, Yeah, and, and then the next logical step would be to understand how you actually execute it. Like, do you have a person who can run the process internally? Um, maybe that person is currently doing some other things, but can just at least start the process. And do you have do you have the necessary resources and experience in house? And if not, then maybe hire a sustainability advisor or someone to help. Yeah, that's great advice. Uh, all right, let's let's talk about the elephant in the room, which we haven't discussed yet, uh, even though Elodie's already brought it up uh, very briefly, uh, which is greenwashing, uh, the strategy of tricking others and particularly the public into thinking you're doing impactful things uh, to obscure a, a less positive truth. Um, it's done by corporations worldwide, of course, but I'm guessing it's also uh, being done by investment firms, uh, Elodie, uh, without naming names, although I'm not. Uh, do you find that there's a lot of greenwashing going on in the European investment space? So I will speak for what I've seen in my, you know, my short time in the role, what I've seen of the VC industry. And I have to say, I have been extremely pleasantly surprised by the overwhelming, you know, collaborative, uh, candid and quite open and transparent sort of culture that I found. Um, there are a number of industry groups uh, specifically looking at, you know, the intersection of VC and sustainability, of which I'm all part of, that have proven to be incredible resources, but also just incredible forums to have those honest conversations around, you know, no one's nailed sustainability 100%. We're all on that journey. And how can we best learn and leverage each other's experience um, to, as an industry, 
get ourselves from sort of A to B to, you know, to C to so. So I think, so that's one thing I will say. However, you know, there is still an element of greenwashing. And I think that greenwashing, a lot of greenwashing come, is, you know, ultimately is a data and measurement problem. It's just imagine we would, you know, imagine having to sort of measure, we, we are not able to fully understand the net impact of any single investment. By net impact, I mean, by backing this business, well, all the sort of positive impacts I am, you know, the, the capital allocation is having in terms of job creation and, you know, economic stimulation and, you know, even environmental impact, but also there are always going to be negative impacts. We know, for example, that a lot of uh, the innovation around, you know, in the for, for the much needed energy transition are having a huge negative impact on nature and biodiversity loss. So it's really having to look at every single investment sort of holistically. And sometimes there's some conceptions that something looks really green and good when actually if you look at the sort of whole picture less so. The example that always comes to mind is those, I'm sorry if it's a little bit off topic, but those um, you know, cotton uh, tote bags have sort of become hugely pro popular uh, as plastic bags got rolled out. But what people don't know is that you actually need to use your tote bag at least 170 times, I think, for it to, to be more environmentally friendly than a plastic bag. Just looking at the carbon emissions involved in producing of a plastic bag versus a cotton bag. So sorry, that's a very lot, you know, so long-winded um, example to, to say that there is still a lot of, sort of greenwashing out there. I think a lot of it I like to think it's still unintentional and we're just it is a race uh, you know towards more more data a race to the top i like to, to think towards more data and better measurement so elodie it's good that you brought up this uh, this topic of uh, collaboration uh, because i've only recently become aware of something called impact vc uh, for the listeners out there that's a community of about 120 venture capital firms uh, with over 12 billion pounds worth of assets under management, uh, so quite a, a hefty bunch. Uh, they're looking to essentially help make the world a better place uh, together. Uh, what is something that you can tell us about this initiative? Because I, I didn't know about it until very, very recently. Um, I think this morning when they launched their uh, campaign. Yeah, so we're actually launching um, the playbook that this collective um, has been working on, and I was uh, part of the working group. So. At its core, it's really a bringing together uh, VC investors, both impact investors, so impact funds and generally funds that believe in the business case for impact and just want to sort of work together to develop more tools and knowledge and insights and resources to do that better and faster. So hopefully what, for example, will help us Bolton get that 29% of companies explicitly backing SFG um, higher over time. Um, so it's a great example of collaboration uh, that we're seeing in the industry. And if you're mentioning Impact VC, it might be worth mentioning, mentioning the two other main groups, so Venture ESG and ESG VC. And those two are actually really focusing at um, that other end of the spectrum that I guess both Christine and I touched on, which was companies and investments that aren't weren't designed you know set up for impact um in in the first instance but are, who are having an impact and just how they're set up and how they operate so really trying to establish a really solid ESG foundation um in all VC funds and their investments yeah, that sounds like really great initiatives so I'm looking forward to learning more um Christine uh, same question that I asked earlier have you seen a lot of greenwashing in the European VC industry, uh, is it a problem? And if so, what can be done about it? I will agree with Elodie that uh, we have to celebrate the progress that has been made and every step in the right direction. I, I completely support that and do celebrate that. But uh, I think there's also, uh, at least in the corporate environment and also in the in the, the startup and scale up space, uh, the greenwashing is still a, a big topic. And just today I was reading an article about this and 
I think my conclusion is that companies have become more creative with their greenwashing efforts and uh, more and more new kinds of greenwashing appear. For example, have you heard a term called green crowding? It means that the company is hiding in a group and moving at the speed of the slowest adapter on sustainability policies and practices. Or green shifting is when company imply that the consumer is at fault and shift the blame on them. So in essence, there's still a lot of greenwashing happening in many different forms. Uh, in this article, I think there was they, na they named eight or nine in total. <laughs> wow. But uh, as with anything, I think for companies and also investors to stop doing it, there has to be clear consequences. And on that side, the, the ball is on the regulator side. And... EU taxonomy, of course, is doing the right thing to help and, and structure this and create some terminology on what is good, what is not good. But we are still, uh, there's still a way to go. Yeah, I think that's the, that's the conclusion here. Um, thanks to both of you for sharing your insights. I'm going to leave and wrap up the discussion with closing thoughts from you. Uh, so putting you on the spot once again. Um, Elodie, we're going to start with you. Any closing thoughts on sustainability in European VC? I mean, this is the start of the, the journey and this is a team sport of probably my two, you know, main takeaways. And, and I mean, you know, if we have some VCs who are listening to us today, who are thinking about getting started, but not necessarily knowing how, um, two things, one, you know, just get going. Um, you will be surprised by how you know how, how open and collaborative the industry is and how people will be very open including myself feel free to reach out to sort of share experiences and, and practical tips and realities of, of embarking on that journey um and and secondly i think um j just celebrating the, the sort of the small wins without falling into greenwashing um, and really realizing that the potential VC, like we have an as an industry, we have an incredible opportunity of planting that seed so early on of this next generation of businesses that will potentially make or break us as economies and societies. So let's seize that opportunity. Great, Christine. Elodie, you put it so well that I don't think I have to add anything on top of it. That's exactly what I what I think and what I personally also believe in. We have to ce celebrate every step in the right direction. We have to get moving. There's a lot of work ahead of us. Um, and there are a lot of amazing people who have helped me and who are there to support everyone who is heading into this direction, myself included. So, yeah. Thank you, Robin, for hosting this conversation. Uh, I, I think this this has been very, very insightful. That was my absolute pleasure. And I'm going to put in the show notes uh, links to, to your profile so people can reach out uh, if they want to. Nice. Uh, thank you so much for joining the discussion. There's a lot more to be done, a lot more to be said. Uh, we'll keep that for a later date. So thank you again. And thank you for uh, watching or listening. <laughs>